Hi friends, this is Pastor Robert Jacobson here at Tribuco Canyon Community Church. You've tuned in on the first Sunday of the month and our practice here at Tribuco Canyon Community Church is to celebrate the Lord's Supper on that first Sunday of the month. And, and so if if you're home, as as you're watching the service take place, I want to encourage you even now to, to go and prepare the elements. Grab some either grape juice or some wine, grab some bread or, or crackers or, or something along those lines and, and join us as together we remember Christ's great gift and his mighty salvation that he purchased for us.
there's an intro video that runs for three minutes. Instead of three million. <laughs> Let's worship the triune God this morning. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let me, my enemies triumph over me. No one whose heart is not. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Lord, we come this morning to gather and lift up not just our voices, but our souls, because it is you in whom we trust. It is you in whom we hope. So as we come before you in song, as we open your word, tune our hearts and our ears to hear your voice. Minister to us. My soul, my sing. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. The steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I
Last week, we are not overcome, and the thought of sometimes it feels like the world is so heavy and that we can't possibly carry the burdens anymore, and yet when we can lay them at the feet of Jesus, we are not overcome. It is his great love for us. It doesn't crush us, doesn't bruise us, but yet we can stand because of Christ's great love. Let's sing, we are not overcome. will fail, bones will break, these will steal. Trust in the earth. Put no trust. In the earth. In the sun. Stand upon. Flowers fade. Into dust. The Lord will make. A place for us. Because of his great love. Because of. working because of
heads in prayer with me as together we confess our sin before the Lord. Lord God, we're going to be reminded this morning in your word about how you're a God who remembers and is faithful. And how I wish that were true of your people as well. How I wish that were true of me, that we would always, Lord, remember who we are, that we would always be faithful to the God who's been faithful to us. But how often we forget. Lord, we, we forget your goodness, we forget your great love, we forget the union we have with you, and we forget ourselves, and rather than thinking and acting like the children of God that we are, we, we act like orphans. We don't have the Lord God for our Father. We act like we don't have your Spirit to lead and comfort and guide and fix. Forgive us. Forgive us for failing to do what we know we shouldn't. Sorry, forgive us for failing to do what we know we should. Forgive us for doing what we know we shouldn't. For these and for all of our sins, we ask that you'd show us mercy for Christ's sake as we confess them before you. Lord, we thank you for the assurance of pardon that you give us in your word. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because of its weakness by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And it's in him we trust and find our assurance. Praise be to his glory for his name. Sing holy, holy, holy. Oh. 
God in three persons. God in three persons. Blessed You may be seated. This morning, as is our practice on the first Sunday of the month, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Throughout the Bible, we see that God relates to his people based on covenant. And and so you see at the beginning, there was a covenant with Abraham, covenant with Noah, I'm sorry, covenant with Adam, covenant with Noah, covenant with Abraham, covenant with, with Moses. Throughout the Bible, God relates to his people via covenant. And and covenants are are basically agreements, uh, agreements by which we're going to relate to one another or God's going to relate to his people. So, So in the Old Testament, the way God related to his people was through sacrifice and through the priesthood. So so if, if you wanted to come to God, if you wanted to relate to God, you, you brought a sacrifice to the temple, and you offered it to the priest who would offer it on your behalf so that things could be right between you and God. When Jesus comes and he institutes the Lord's Supper, one of the things he says, and we'll, we'll hear it again when we, we get to the words of institution, is, is he said, he says, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And and what he means by that is is that now there's going to be a new way of relating to God, that in fact, he is the sacrifice and he is the priest. So no longer do we we come bringing our own sacrifice and offer it to to a priest who, who we don't know. No, we come now to Jesus, who is not only the priest who offers the sacrifice, but he's the sacrifice himself which is why he declares that this is the new covenant in his blood because he is going to be the way now by which we come to God and relate to God. And so, friends, if if you're here today and you're a Christian, you understand Jesus not to just be some, some historical interesting figure, but you understand him to be both Lord and Christ, your sacrifice and your priest, then we welcome you to celebrate this covenant feast with us. The Bible says when we partake in this, we proclaim his death until he comes. And, and what that means is we're declaring to the world this new covenant that we're enjoying. We can come before God because of what Christ has done for us. And so if that's true of you, we welcome you to this table. If, if you didn't get the chance to, to grab your elements on the way and just raise your hand, Ron's got them in the back. Ron, if you'll bring them, if you'll bring them down, you cover that side, I'll cover this side. Let's pray. Father God, you tell us in your word of a song in heaven that is sung of our Savior. In the the book of Revelation, we we hear that the song is being sung. You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Lord God, you've you've bought us as your own. And the price of that purchase is remembered at this table. It's it's a reminder of of the great cost, the great love, and the great work that will not be undone for those who've been redeemed in Christ Jesus. No one can steal them away. The price has been paid. So we come to this table thankful. Thankful that we're yours. And just as we remember 
that reality by placing into our bodies the symbols of our redemption, would you put that same truth deep in our hearts and in our souls and in our minds as we celebrate this meal? Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said unto his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, you who said, I am the bread of life, would you satisfy our souls supremely with your life? Amen. In the same way, Christ took the cup and said to his disciples, this is the cup of the new covenant do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, you tell us in your word that wine makes the heart go glad. So Lord, even as we partake of this fruit of the vine, would our hearts be overjoyed? at the reality that, that we are found in you, that you are the vine and we are the branches, that because of what you've done for us and because of the faith you've given us, our union with you is all that it should be. Praise be to your glory this morning. Before we dismiss the kids off to Sunday school, let's uh, take a moment and go before the Lord in prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we, we come with thankful hearts, rejoicing and delighting in all the works of your hands. And above all, we, we delight in your son Jesus in whose name we now come. To bring the things that are weighing heavy on our hearts, Lord, you tell us to cast our cares on you you care for us. So Lord, even, even now we, we bring before you those who we know and love who are in need of healing. We pray for strength and restoration. We think of our dear friend of Mike, Sarah, who's suffering now with cancer and looks to be close to her home going. Would you grant her either miraculous healing now or complete healing in the resurrection. Lord, we, we, we pray too for those we know and love who don't yet know you as they ought. Call them to yourself. Lord, we ask for those who are suffering, that you would grant strength. For those who are fearful, that you would grant courage. For those who are in need, hear these, and would you hear all of our prayers for Christ's sake that they've been answered. Now, Lord, as we, we get ready to open your word, both here and Sunday school, Lord, prepare our hearts to receive the beauty and bounty you have for us here. Lord, may, may our hearts be like fertile soil, that the seed of your word can take deep root and yield a bountiful harvest of good things. Um, before we dismiss the kids to Sunday school, I'm going to ask Carrie Berry to come up for a quick announcement, and as she does, I'm going to run through a couple other announcements for you. Um, first, we've got Oh, I had all the announcements that I wanted to cover written down. Okay, um, there's a hike that we're going to have not this Monday, but next Monday. If you're interested in that, you can talk to Bob Barry. Also, um, our weekend marriage class is coming up on Friday and Saturday, the 14th and 15th. We've got, um, I think, seven or eight couples signed up for that. If you want to do that, we'd love to have you. 
but you need to sign up ahead of time because there's going to be food involved, okay? So make sure you do that. I'm going to leave that right here. Please don't forget. There's also a snack sign-up sheet. Um, next week's Mother's Day, right? And we don't have anybody bringing snacks. So um, maybe some dads can step it up and go to a donut shop. Uh, uh, I'll leave that up there as well. Um, and then, uh, Carrie, will you come up and share with us uh, a little bit about the Walk for Life? <laughs> Here, oh, you should probably get a mic. Here. Chuck's a good share. Does that work? Close. Probably got a handout in your bulletin uh, for the Walk for Life that's coming up on the 15th. And it is um, a walk for um, a fantastic ministry that's really in our own backyards. It's in San Clemente. Pregnancy Resource Center um, is a, a terrific place to go if you feel really called to have a ministry. Um, the um, it is a way to to reach people, the unreached, for Christ at a time when they are wide open. It is a opportunity for ministry for the young, for teenagers, for men. Men are particularly important at the Pregnancy Resource Center because there's not enough men in the lives of the women who are going through this earthquake. Now, when I call it an earthquake, it's an earthquake because a crisis pregnancy is an earthquake in the lives of a whole family. It is something that changes your life forever. Abortion doesn't erase a pregnancy, it simply ends it, and then you live with the ending of it. So everyone in this room likely has been impacted already by the end of a pregnancy or will be. Your daughters, your daughter's friends, your friends, your friend's daughters, in some way, this is going to come your way. This resource at the, the Pregnancy Resource Center in San Clemente is one I'm intimately familiar with. I was a mommy mentor there for years. We, um, it, it's, a, it's, it's a resource you can turn to that offers everything from ultrasounds to, um, to guidance, adoption guidance. If the, if the mother decides she wants to give the child to adoption, it helps with housing. It helps with, there is even a, um, a little boutique in there. Um, you earn you earn, when you come in to learn through the mommy mentoring classes, you earn dollars to get supplies for your baby. It is um, a, a wonderful ministry, and their walk for life is on May 15th, which is coming right up. It starts at 8.15. It's the check-in is 8.15, and the walk begins at 9 o'clock, and they're going to meet this year at the outlets in San Clemente. It is a lot of fun. It, it's just a lot of fun. You can sign up to um, walk. You can get sponsors. I have sponsor sheets. If anybody decides they want to do it, I'll be your first sponsor. Sorry, Bob. Ah. <laughs> so I mean that I have sign-up sheets here if anybody wants to do it. I can't recommend it enough because it's fun because it's at the beach. You're at the beach. You're with fellow Christians. It's a wonderful opportunity for your your kids to get engaged, and kids love this. They get engaged, and it gets them prepared early on to the thought of what might happen in their friends' lives or even their own when they get older, uh, especially in the church. We don't talk about unplanned pregnancies often. Uh, we don't talk about it, and sometimes our own people can be more isolated than people that are not in church. So I'm talking about it to you all. And um, come to me, call me um, if you have any questions, my phone number, my email, um, the Walk for Life on the 15th. Thank you. The, um, it's, it's a great organization. Uh, they didn't have the Walk for Life last year. Uh, the week, year before, Grace and Paul and Amy and I did it. It was down in um, uh, Dana, po Dana Point. Uh, great organization. The, um, the one thing is we planned our marriage seminar 
before we got word that they were having this walk on the same time. So um, if you're married and are thinking about coming to the marriage seminar, come to the marriage seminar. You can walk for life next year. If you're single or weren't planning on coming to the marriage seminar, then go ahead and, and, and have at it. Uh, the one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, we've, got not, we've got two more books, I'm sorry, two more weeks left in Gentle and Lowly for our Tuesday morning book study. Um, and then we start a new book. So if, if you're interested in being a part of our Tuesday morning book study, it goes from like 6.30 in the morning to 7.15. Men's, yes, men's book study. That, yeah, that would be weird. Uh, uh, we're, we're currently meeting via Zoom, and, uh, and I, I think by then we'll actually start meeting up at the church and via Zoom. So I'll at least be up here, and if anybody wants to come up and hang out and have coffee with me, they can, and, um, and that's the plan for that. But we're going to be going through J.I. Packer's Concise Theology. Someone marked Concise Theology. It's like almost 300 pages. Yeah, I know. But the chapters are like three pages a piece, okay? So uh, it'll take us a couple years to get through it, but um, it'll be well worth it. So, uh, all right, kids, Sunday school, have fun. And the rest of you can take your Bibles and open them to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. Um, you'll find uh, an outline in your bulletin that I hope and pray will prove helpful to you. Genesis chapter 8. And what we're going to do is we're going to read verses 1 through 4 of chapter 8 and then jump down to verse 20 and read through 917. If you're able this morning, will you stand for the reading of God's holy word? Hear the word of the Lord. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountain of Ararat. Now down to verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, Summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number on the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, and upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you, just as I gave you green plant, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made him. As for you, Be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those who came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off By the waters of a flood, never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between 
me in the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth, the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. This is God's word. You may be seated. Okay, so if if you'll remember from last week, and I left it in the outline this morning, based on the chiastic structure, the chiastic literary structure that we looked at, the main point about this section of Scripture is that God remembered Noah. Remember, X marks the spot, and, and that's why verse 1 of chapter 8 is what we're focusing on. God remembered Noah, and that's why every one of your points from this morning's message has to do with God remembering. Now, when the Bible says God remembered Noah, it's not as if God, uh, God is suffering from temporary amnesia. It's, it's not as if when it says God remembers Noah, it's not as if like when I say, oh, I remembered where my keys are. No, that, that, that's not what it's saying. God isn't forgetful. When, when the Bible says God remembers, it's, it's often used of God's faithfulness to his covenant promises. And so when God remembered Abraham, he saved Lot. When God remembered Rachel, he opened up her womb. So God remembering is a way of, of the Bible speaking to us that God is faithful to his promises, which he always is. He, he might not always be faithful to his promises in our timing, but as we sing, right, my, my God will come through always. Great is his faithfulness. So the first thing I want us to look at this morning is that God remembered Noah, even through the trial, even though he didn't succeed. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, in the scriptures, the number 40 is often, especially when it's, um, when it's put together with a time period of days or years, the number 40 is often pointing to a time of trial and or testing. So, for example, Moses, when he went up to Mount Sinai, fasted for 40 days when he received the law. The spies were in the land of Canaan for 40 days. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. Goliath taunts the armies of Israel for 40 days. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. So 40 days, oftentimes when you come across it, look to see if it correlates to a time of trial or testing. So Noah is on the ark, and it rains for 40 days, just like God had foretold. Now, uh, one of the things you'll notice in the text is that during those 40 days, God doesn't speak to Noah. I, I don't want to make too much about this, uh, but if I'm Noah, I would have appreciated like a daily conference call, right? Okay, the monkeys are really acting up. I don't know what to do with them. Can you help me out here? You, you got me shut in. <laughs> you got me shut in with all the animals. The, the elephants, they're just bumping into everything. The, the hippos, they're eating the gopher wood left and right. What am I supposed to do? But, you know, there's, there's not a daily conference call, not a weekly conference call. It's just, God's quiet. Uh, again, I, I, I don't want to make too much of this, but I've noticed that sometimes, especially when I'm in a time of, of trial, that Sometimes God's silent. So sometimes when you're, you're in a season of trial or testing and, and you want that conference call with God or, or you want a, a, a great sensing of his presence, sometimes that's not there. Sometimes it doesn't come. And all you have to 
go on is what he's already revealed to you. We just have to stick with it. So when God seems silent, it doesn't mean he's forgotten you. When God seems distant, it doesn't mean that he is. The Bible says, in him we live and move and have our being. God didn't forget Noah. Not only do we see that God remembered Noah, we also see that God remembered his, his purposes. God had, had purposes in the world he created, in his creation, and creation is renewed. So, you remember last week when we were talking about the flood and, and we read through this whole passage, right? The imagery that the Bible gives us back in Genesis 1 of how the world came into being is God taking the waters and separating them to the waters above and the waters belief below and then earth appearing. And, and we saw last week that when the flood comes, what happens, right? God opens up the windows of heaven and he opens up the springs of the earth and, and the waters come down again. And so it's, it's a picture of decreation with the flood. Well, what is it that happens here? This week we see a picture of recreation. Remember back in Genesis when it talks about the creation of the world and, and it says, the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit, the, the ruach of God was hovering over the waters. Look at verse one of chapter eight. God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were in it, with him in the ark. And he sent a wind, a ruach, over the earth. And the waters receded. And now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed. And the rain had stopped falling from the sky. Do you, do you, do you see what's going on? It, it's real clear by the language that's being used is God is trying to communicate us, to us that there was creation, then there was this decreation with the flood, now there's this recreation that's taking place. So just like in Genesis 1 at creation, here at recreation, you have God's ruach, his spirit, his wind hovering over the waters. And this act of separating the waters from the waters happened in Genesis 1. It's undone in Genesis 7. It's redone in Genesis 8. God's making a new land, a new earth, a new creation. And we also see this recreation idea in how Noah is portrayed like a second Adam. Okay, so there's all sorts of parallels between Adam and Noah. The flood is creation 2.0, if you would, and, and Noah is like a new Adam. Uh, th these are some of the parallels I, I found from my study, and, and Kevin DeYoung was especially helpful in, in listing these. Both worlds are formed from a watery chaos. Both Adam and Noah are associated explicitly with the image of God. Both are said to have walked with God, both rule and exercise dominion over animals. So remember, Adam, he, he talks to the animals, the animals come. Noah, he, he gathers the animals into the ark, right? Both are told to be fruitful and multiply. Both work the ground. Both Adam and Noah follow a similar pattern of sinning, so right? Adam sinned in eating in a garden. We'll see that Noah sins in drinking in a vineyard. And the result of both their sin is an exposure, a humbling, an embarrassing nakedness. Both have three sons. Uh, Adam has Cain, Abel, and Seth. Noah has Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And both of these sons are divided into the elect and the non-elect, the, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, if you would. Um, the word blessed is only used up till this time. The only time it's been used of humans was first of Adam, and now it's being used again of Noah and his sons. You, you know how seven is the biblical number for fullness or completion? Eight is the number of renewal or recreation. Okay? So how many people are on the ark? Eight. From these eight will come recreation or the repopulation of people on the planet. On what day are the sons of Israel to be circumcised according to the Abrahamic covenant? On the eighth day. Okay. Most importantly, Jesus, it says, rose from the dead on the first day of the week. That's, that's a week 
plus one. In other words, the eighth day. And, and if you look at the way it's worded in, in Greek in the New Testament, it's almost trying to belabor the statement. It's not just saying Sunday, but it's saying on a week plus one on the eighth day. Eight is the number of recreation and renewal. It's a new page in history. Right? The, the, this idea of recreation is a theme that's echoed all throughout Scripture. The world was good, the world has fallen, the world will be redeemed. And the fullness of that recreation, the fullness of that redemption is found in Jesus, who's a greater Noah. He, he too was a preacher of righteousness. He too announces the coming judgment. And, and the way to get through judgment and into the new creation is through him. Right? It, for Noah, if you want to escape the judgment, get on board the boat. If you want to escape the next judgment, get into the ark that is Jesus, if you would. But he's greater than Noah because he doesn't just offer a way into the renewed world. He promises to renew you now and give you eternal life. He doesn't just say, take shelter in me and I'll get you out on the other side. No, he says, take shelter in me and I'm going to make you new. I'm going to transform you. Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he may not enter into the kingdom of God. And, and how does that new birth take place? Another term in that, in, in, in that same dialogue that Jesus had is being born of the Spirit. The, the new birth takes place by the Spirit. The Spirit who created order out of the chaos at creation and after the flood brought order into the, the, the recreation, that same Spirit can bring peace into your chaotic heart if you'll come to Christ. If you'll turn from your sin, if you'll turn from your self-salvation strategies, if, if you trust in what Jesus Christ has accomplished in his sinless life, a life of complete and perfect obedience to his Father, what he's accomplished in his sacrificial death on the cross where he atoned for sin, what he's accomplished in his resurrection from the dead. If you trust in him, He'll be the ark of your salvation. He and he alone can recreate you and make you brand new. Christian, rejoice. Christian, rejoice that you're already a new creation in Christ. You're, you're not all the way there. That, that complete transformation will take place in the resurrection when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. But, but that new kingdom is present in you in seed form. Maybe even more than seed form for many of you. If any of you are in Christ, he's a new creation, the Bible says. And if you're listening today, and you're not yet a Christian, rejoice that you now know there is a way of escape. Rejoice that you now have a hope. Rejoice that that if you turn to Christ in faith and repentance, you can be made new as well. Flee the coming judgment and find refuge in Jesus. So we see God has not forgotten Noah and he's not forgotten his purposes in creation and he will renew creation. And Christian, you are already a part of that. If you're an unbeliever, you can be a part of that, even today. Notice, too, that God's purposes in creation aren't thwarted. God's image bearer is protected. Look at, uh, remember some of the things the text says says God's not going to flood the earth again. So, so in other words, when it starts raining, people don't have to start worrying, uh-oh, here comes another flood. Animals are, are going to be afraid. I, you know, 
I don't know what it was like in the Garden of Eden. I, I'm, I'm kind of an animal lover. I, I would have liked being able to address animals and have them obey. I can, I can barely get my cat to obey a good day, right? And so um, I, I don't know what that was like, but now animals would be afraid of humans. Apparently they weren't, at least to that degree, prior to the flood. Also, there's going to be a reckoning of life, of the life of man, because man's created in the image of God. And notice how that image of God language is, is linked with sin. So the, the Bible gives us a very clear picture of reality. On the one hand, the Bible says, look, you're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. You're the pinnacle of God's creation. And the other hand, it says, but you're sinful. We know this from what Adam did. We know this from the necessity of the flood. Man is sin still sinful regardless of how wonderful he is. Wonderful he is. Now, now, that's a picture of reality that's a real stark contrast to the secular culture in which we live in. The secular culture doesn't really have a category for sin, does it? The secular culture divorces creature from creator. It presents man as, well, essentially good. Think of all the great evil that kind of unrealistic thinking about the nature of man has brought about. One scholar says, the worst schemes of history have always come from those who think that you can make heaven on earth. Some of the worst perpetrators of evil think of totalitarian regimes, think of communism or socialism over the past hundred plus years, are those who have thought that human nature is basically good that human nature is malleable, that the proper government does not need to take into account the fallenness of the world that we inhabit. The beginning of any sort of cultural advancement or proper government must be with an awareness that we live in a broken world. We live in a world full of conflict with sin. We do not live in a utopia, and we will not bring heaven on earth. So while the Bible is clear that we are image bearers, the Bible is also clear that we are sinful. So God has determined that he will not annihilate man again. He will protect his image bearer. We'll talk about some of those implications further in a moment. We see that God remembers Noah, he remembers his purposes, and God remembered his covenant. As I mentioned earlier at communion, at the Lord's Supper, the way God relates to us as human beings is through covenant. The way God deals with us is through covenant. So we have the covenant with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, with, with David. And covenants are, are basically agreements, agreements by which we're going to relate to each other. So perhaps the, the, the clearest form of a covenant that we have in our day and age is what takes place at marriage, right? I, I don't know how many dozens of weddings I performed here at the church, but I normally stand right about here. I got a couple right in front of me, and, and they come to establish a covenant between one another, and they declare to the witnesses how they are now going to relate to another. And so in the wedding ceremony, they make promises one to another. I'm, I'm going to love, honor, respect. I'm going to keep myself only unto her as long as we both shall live. These ideas these, these foundational guidelines by which this covenant is going to be established. And there are requirements on, on both ends of the marriage covenant. In this episode that we read of, starting in, in verse 6, where it starts talking about Noah and all the way here to, I'm sorry, starting in chapter 6 and all the way here to chapter 9, Chapter 6 is, is the first time we see this word covenant in all the Bible. It's the first time it's used. And then it's, it's used in, with increasing uh, repetition here as we read through it from verse 9 on. Now, now, this covenant is really unique in all the Bible because this Noahic covenant, or the covenant of Noah, 
It's actually not really a covenant with Noah. The, the, we call it the Noah covenant because it indicates the time in which the covenant took place. But it, it says it's a covenant with all flesh. God makes a covenant with all flesh. And this is really unique because it's what theologians call a universal covenant. It's not just with God's elect or God's people. It's with, or God's chosen people, it's with all flesh. And it's a unilateral covenant. Unlike marriage, where there's vows set on both sides, this is a one-way covenant. God simply promises to do something, or, or more particularly, he promises not to do something, and that is flood the earth again. And it's unconditional. God, God doesn't say, I promise not to flood the earth again as long as you toe the line. As long as you're really good, as long as you keep obeying me. No, he, he simply promises not to flood the earth. Now, this idea of Yahweh, the Lord God, being a God of covenant is, is really somewhat unique. It, it, it shows that God is engaged with his creation. It, it shows that God communicates to his creation and even makes promises to his creation. He's, he's a God who holds himself to his word, to his covenant. He's not arbitrary. We, if you understand the Bible, you didn't wake up this morning and say to yourself, boy, I hope God didn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed today. You don't need to worry about that, that God's going to be arbitrary or fickle because he's a God of covenant. He's a God who's faithful. We, he's a God whose nature does not change. What does Hebrews 13, 8 say? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We, we sing, thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. God does, isn't going to give himself a makeover anytime soon or ever. Th this is not the case with pagan gods, right? So the first readers of Genesis, the gods they would have been familiar with would have been the gods of the Canaanites and the gods of the Egyptians. Those gods, you never know what you're going to get when you wake up in the morning. Those gods are fickle. They, they, they don't communicate to their people because they're not real gods. They're capricious. You, you just wake up and hope, well, I, I hope I've made enough sacrifices. Friends, take, take a moment and rejoice over that, that your God is a faithful God, that he's a God who's true, that he's a God who keeps his promises, that he's a God who's true to you. You know, we're, we're coming up on a marriage class, and there, there's a great line, and I, it's not in my manuscript. I, I forget who said it but uh, it, it comes to me. Um, there's, there's a pastor who starts his marriage classes like this. He says, my wife's, have been, my wife's been married to six different men, and they've all been me. Those of you who've been married a while know, know what he means, because we change. Friends, God doesn't change God's a faithful God. And he remembers his covenant and he gives us a sign. And, and actually the sign seems to be not just for us, but for him as well. And it's the sign of rainbow. We've got one here in the sanctuary, right? You, you see our Noah's Ark window, the rainbow, Mount Ararat, right in there. Or the mountain range of Ararat. And that rainbow is a sign that God would preserve life. Now, over the last 20 years or so, the rainbow has taken on different new meanings in our culture. It's become the flag of the sexual revolution. I don't think we as Christians should give up on rainbows. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, hear me out. For the last four or 5,000 years, rainbow was a sign of God's faithfulness to his promise to not flood the earth again. And now in the last like 20 years, some people have started waving around saying this is the flag of the sexual revolution. No, 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 no. We're not going to give them that. In fact, I have, I have a friend who's a pastor up in LA, PJ, and uh, every time he 
he, he walks by like, uh, sometimes you'll see these, these flags being flown at city halls or things. He'll, he'll do a little Facebook video and, and record it. And him being a preacher, I, I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people know, a lot of people think they know what he's going to say about his little video. But, but he, he normally goes this way. He normally records it and says, you know what? My heart's just so encouraged by seeing the rainbow and being reminded of God's goodness and his faithfulness not to flood the earth again. If you remember back in the, the God, God flooded the earth one time because the wickedness of man was so overwhelming and he's promised not to do that again. And he's given us redemption in Christ. And, and so he, he makes a little sermon out of it, right? Which on Facebook, it's great because it always creates all kinds of fun controversy and people arguing and things like that. There's some interesting online discussion. But if you look at the text in the original Hebrew, the focus of the rainbow isn't actually on the colors. It's on the shape. It's not on the colors. It's on the shape. And, and the picture here is of God hanging up his war bow. That's, that's the language used. The, the, the language is the same language that's used in Psalm 711, where it says, God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. If he does not relent, he will sharpen his sword. He will bend and string his bow. Same word used there. And, and so the idea is that the rainbow is a sign that, that God won't, won't take his bow and aim it at the earth with the arrows of a flood again, but he's taken it and put it up on the shelf. God won't eliminate evil, but he will mitigate its effects. And so, he grants certainty. He, 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 he grants a certainty that he won't doom the ground again via flood. He grants the certainty of seasons. We, we won't wake up in July and wonder if it's going to snow, right? There's going to be a regularity to the cycles and seasons of the earth. He grants the certainty of food to help preserve man. Not only will man eat fruit and vegetables, but animals as well. I have, I have a dear friend who many of you know, I won't mention his name, but he, he says if God didn't mean for man to eat animals, he wouldn't have made them so tasty. Um, apologies to our vegetarian friends out there. But even though they're not explicit conditions in this covenant, God goes on to communicate expectations and obligations. So there's an obligation for mankind to reproduce, to be fruitful and multiply. Again, echoes of what we heard given to Adam and Eden. So young people, get married, have babies. Children are a blessing from the Lord, right? We're, we're Christians. We see children not as a burden, but we see them as a blessing, some people come and say, well, you know, I've got, I'm so leery about bringing kids into this wicked world. You know what? Have some faith in God. Don't, don't you think God knows what kind of kids he's going to give you? Don't you think he knows what kind of kids this world needs? Maybe, maybe your kids, instead of worrying about how influenced they're going to be by the world, think of how God might use them to influence the world. There's an obligation for mankind to reproduce. There's restrictions on food. Um, eat animals, but not with lifeblood in it. Now, let me just be clear. All scholars that I've read agree that it's not talking about eating steak with prayer. Praise be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Because that's how I like mine. So, some understand it. Don't eat meat like an animal. Okay? Some understand it to mean uh, prepare it, cook it. Some understand it to be, you know, don't. Some of you have seen movies, you know, where, you know, they, they, they kill an animal and the first thing they do is there on the field, they, you know, they pull out the heart and eat it or something like that. We're not supposed to do that. So there's obligation to reproduce. There's restrictions on food. There's also reckoning for bloodshed. Look at verse 5 and 6. 
for your lifeblood, I will surely demand a reckoning or an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. Each man, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, man, in the image of God has God made man. So this is the first law that we see in the Bible. It's the law of capital punishment for murder. This is, if if you would, the old lex talionis, right? An eye for an eye. Now, some people in our culture see that as barbaric, but it's actually a rather advanced law for the time because it mandates proportionate justice versus what we saw in Lamech, right? Where where you know, it, it's overreaction. Now, now we don't have time to go into a lengthy discussion on capital punishment. That's typically where this discussion of the, this passage goes, but I, I do want to look at this verse from a different angle. Look at verse 5 again. For your lifeblood, I will surely demand an account. I will demand an account. From every animal, each man to I will demand an account of your life blood. So it, it doesn't say, for your blood, your family may demand an accounting. Or your family may demand a reckoning. It, it, it says, I will demand an account. Which should show us that we are not our own. We belong to to God. Friend, your life is not your own. God has a claim on it. You are made by God and for God to glorify and honor God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. And he calls you to stop living like your God. He calls you to stop defining good and evil for yourself. He calls you to stop living as if you don't need him. God your maker has claim on your life. And he calls you to take the life that he's given to you and to use it for his glory. He's he's hung up his bow and will never flood the earth again. Friends, that does not mean that judgment will not come on the disobedient. I'm going to close with this passage from 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3, 3. First of all, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the word at that time was deluged and destroyed. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is but like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. You ought to look forward to the day of God and to see it its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of God. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your patience. 
thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your great love. Lord, as those who've been made by you, Lord, you you are well within your right to wipe out the earth and start anew without us. But in your mercy and your grace, you've given us new life in you. So Lord, we we look ahead to the day of your return, not with fear, but with delight, with rejoicing that that the, the kingdom of God that's here, present with us in seed form, will be fully realized on the day of your return. Come quickly. And as we wait, help us to live as people who are truly yours, who are faithful to the God who's been faithful to us. We pray in Christ's name. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And we're going to close by singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness this morning. If you're able, will you, will you stand with us and sing? And, uh, and when we wrap up, there's, um, there's treats in the back. There's, uh, there's some yogurt uh, and granola. There's also some Norwegian waffles. I don't, you might have to be good sharers. Uh, but, but let's sing together as we close. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, not forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. i uh-huh.
is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you, give you his peace as you go in his grace, trusting in his great goodness. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. Oh, real quick, um, thanks to everybody who did so much work yesterday in getting the parking lot ready for our new slurry seal this week. And if anybody's got an hour next week that they want to help me shovel some dirt, let me know. Thanks. Uh, see you in the